we're starting uh, on this new series, uh, and I, uh, as I said, we we're gonna we're gonna call it. Uh, we entitled it "Learning How to Speak Christian," and you know, obviously, the you know, it, it, it's it's something that's gonna uh, make you know some folks think think what what do you mean by that? You know, that's not a language, is it? But it, it kind of uh, is, in a sense that we all kind of develop our little subcultural languages. Um, like, you know, Larry, I'm sure in your trade there are words, terms you guys use that you don't normally use when you, you know, talk to other people. And, sure. and then when we do music, there are certain words we use that, that we don't normally use when, uh, you know, in, in everyday conversations. And the same thing happens with, uh, with, with the, the language of the church. Um, one of the problems, though, that, that I've seen over time that I've, that I've noticed, and starting with myself, actually, this is not something that's, uh, uh, you know, um, a problem with, with, <laughs> with, with uh, it's a problem with all of us, really, is that there are some words that are really important that uh, uh, we only use within the context of the church, but unfortunately, they, they've kind of become almost like noise and, and, and have very little meaning. And the reason for that is because we don't really have uh, cultural, everyday references for these words. So they kind of become designated church words. Uh, when you hear the word, you kind of think, okay, that's, that's, that's a, uh, you know, some churchy pious term, but it's, uh, you know, you don't really connect it to, to a deeper, deeper meaning. And, you know, I was trying to think of some examples of our, like, how, how, what, what we can compare it to, to our everyday life, you know, and if we were to say, for example, that there's a politician who is a corrupt politician in bed with a big pharma. Well, that phrase in bed we use because there is a social reality behind that that we, you know, kind of transfer then into, in, 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 into, into this. Morning. Morning. Uh, yeah, have a seat. Um, so, uh, so, so that's, that's where it comes from. These words, these terms actually have a certain social reality behind them that, um, uh, that, that informs them. And the same thing happened in the Bible, actually. A lot of these terms that we're going to go over... We're not theological words. This is not, you know, just a high and mighty term that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Uh, these were actually words from everyday life that they use to express express certain relationships. And, and uh, like I said, there's a number of them in the in the Bible that uh, you know you see them throughout the book. They're very important <laughs> concepts, but I believe that our understanding of them is rather shallow because we don't we're not acquainted with the, with the cultural context. So we're not going to be diving into like theological words, you know, like for example the Trinity, I guess, is one, but or like the hypostatic union or some some you know heady stuff that theologians used to kind of uh, sum up certain teachings. We're actually going to go through words that are found in the Bible itself that are very important for the for the entire uh, plot. So the first one I wanted to dive into today is redemption. Uh, redemption is the main concept of the Bible. Uh, many uh, Bible scholars will say that you know the Bible is a history of redemption. That's the main subject. Uh, obviously, you know we start with the uh, uh, with creation and fall, and after the fall, we're uh, seeing the restoration of the relationship between God and humankind and the rest of creation, really. And that is summed up uh, very often in this term, redemption. So let's uh, we have these handouts. Um, and by the way, I just got to mention that uh, in this particular. Uh, lesson. I'm really relying on the book by Sandra Richter. I actually have a quote from her at the, um, at the very end of it. Um, so, so anyway, my layout is, is, is she, I think she did a fantastic job presenting this particular subject. So I'm, I'm um, going to rely on, uh, on her layout. So let's see the usage of redemption, just a couple of examples. In the New Testament, we see it in the New Testament. And uh, Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ redeemed us. From the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. We read in Luke 1, 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. So, we see it in the New Testament, um, and naturally the New Testament writers uh, got it from the Old Testament. We're going to see here uh, an Old Testament example from Isaiah 43, 1. It says, But now thus says the Lord, uh, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. So, we're not going to need to uh, really discuss the Greek words behind the New Testament meaning, because, or behind, behind the New Testament text, because the Greek writers got it out of the Old Testament, so it's really more important for us to uh, check it out in the, 
Hebrew setting and see what it meant for them. So uh, the basic Hebrew word is ga'al in case you, um, and I have even in the Hebrew letters, I, I, I actually really don't know any Hebrew, so this is just me copy-pasting and trying to be smart. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, that's, on my, that's on my bucket list, you know, to, uh, to, <laughs> to learn Hebrew. But, okay, so this uh, uh, term to redeem is derived from the ordinary life of Israel, ancient Middle Eastern tribal society. In this setting, family was the most basic and essential social unit. No individual could navigate the economic and social landscape apart from the status accorded to them through the family and clan they belong to. All right, so obviously we're not starting with any dictionary definitions of the word redemption. We're trying to actually immerse ourselves as much as we can into the culture out of which this, this, this word arose. And it's important to remember, we're not trying to like canonize the culture and say, oh, the Hebrew culture is the golden norm for everyone and we should all uh, become, uh, you know, tribal pastoralists or, or you know, <laughs> agricultural, uh, you know, we, we all need to have little little farms we work on now. But in order to understand where these words came from, we need to kind of do our best uh, to understand their world. So families, and I, I had mentioned this when uh, uh, a month ago or so, when I, a couple months I guess, when I preached on Ruth, there was actually a lot of this uh, uh, was, was uh, important. Uh, family was the most uh, was the essential unit of, of, of social life and you know we might kind of think of it a little romantically and think oh well that's really nice that they had strong families and yes they had strong families but there was a downside to it basically uh, you were stuck with your family <laughs> it doesn't matter if you have a good family or a bad family those are the people you're, you're stuck with and the rest of society will not interact with you very well unless you come to them through, you know, as a um, representative of your family. Nowadays, um, we, we live in a completely different society. For me, it's important that, you know, for all of us, I guess it's important that we are legal citizens, we have social security numbers, we have our, you know, so I can pick up and leave my wife, not that I intend to do that, but I can pick up and leave my wife and, and start a new life and she can, you know, start, you know, and, and, and we don't have to have anything to do with each other. Uh, same with your parents and so on and so forth. It was very, very, very different uh, back then. Everything is everything started with the family, and the family was 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 patriarchal. And we're going to explore what that actually uh, meant. So we're going to get into these characteristics of the family. So the first uh, thing we want to point out is, like I said, it's patriarchal. Uh, the structure of the family was patriarchal, meaning that the oldest male exercised full authority and had responsibility for the well-being of those who were in his care. The status of others was determined by their gender and birth order. This is why we have uh, such an emphasis in the Bible on the firstborn. You know, you read in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it, it's mentioned. Uh, the firstborn is very important uh, because we, we're going to see that later on, how, how the firstborn born, uh, figures into this. Wasn't it the firstborn male back then? Really? Yes, it was the firstborn male, but we're going to see that actually that doesn't necessarily always mean that it is the actual firstborn, it is actually accorded as a status within the family. That, that's where it kind of gets confused. I mean, it started with, it normally was the firstborn, but then you later on... female, right? So no, 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 no. The firstborn male has to be the first, firstborn, because this is a... Okay, so that's what patriarchal society was, was all about. The only person in that society that really had freedom, I guess, in the loose sense maybe of today's comparison, was the leader of the family. Okay, so, so the oldest man in the family was the only one who actually had the full freedom to, to make decisions. He also had the responsibility for everyone else who was in his care. But uh, women, as we know in patriarchal societies, were, were ranked very low, and also the men who were uh, not the firstborn and not the patriarch himself, they also were, were not, you know, they were somewhat disenfranchised themselves as well. They, they had to follow the lead of, of, of the patriarch. So, so it was, uh, freedoms were, were few and far between essentially is, is, is what I'm trying to say. And families really function more like companies. Okay, families were, were economic units. They would all either farm or, or, or you know, shepherd, or maybe they'd get into some, would get into some trades maybe, but it was a family business. It was always tied to, tied to. I, I noticed that like, you know, foreigners will come here mm -hmm. with their families and they will like, 15 of them live together in a house. Yes. Is, is that from? Yes, yes, exactly. You're spot on. You're spot okay. on. That's it. But that's also the norm in some cultures. That's what I'm, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm even asking. Even the short time like, that I spent in the Dominican Republic, there's, you know, there are these little homes that maybe had one or two bedrooms. Right. There'd be 15, 20 people living there, and it was usually right. all 
within the family unit that parents, cousins, they were, right. all, they were, they were all, all the all the pool, all the resources, the resources yes, together. and, and right. the patriarchy is the Partially because you couldn't afford to do it any other way. Exactly. And it, it's, exactly. I mean, that all goes back to the whole cost of living kind of thing and, yes. and fair wages. However, what I learned having been there, which I'd never thought about, is yeah, we need to fight for fair wages. But the thing is, is um, the people I stayed with, they were missionaries. Mm -hmm. And as Americans, they're like, you know, they paid their housekeeper that would come in and clean like thirty dollars for I don't know a whole week's worth of work. For which seems ridiculous. And I was like, holy cow and they said they said, yeah, we feel terrible, that's all we're paying her. <laughs> However, we can't pay her more hmm. because it would number one, she'd get too dependent on that fundage and they're not there forever. Right. Number two, it would change her it literally it could, for some people it could change their whole attitude about I have money and you don't. Right, right. It, 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 and yeah. so they can't, they couldn't because it would upset that social norm sure. in a ridiculously awful way because once they left, let's say, say they paid her double that and they left a year that later. Go through the whole there is, of other housekeepers. And then, right, yeah, that's, that's part of it. But as well as they right. leave in a year, she's just lost she's, half of yeah. her income. Right, right. right. Instantly. Exactly. And at that $30, was more than the norm as it was, but it wasn't so far above that she could get sure, right. dependent on it. Sure, no. That's... So, and that's what most people in regular society do not understand: is you you yeah. have to be careful of that social balance when it comes to finances. And I never understood that before. No, that's does it make thing. it does it make it right? No. Not necessarily. But you, if you upset that social norm and that social balance, it could yep. get ugly. And we are actually going to talk about that a lot more when we talk about slavery. That's one of our uh, subjects down so, down, down, you down, know, down. That's, that's very that's small thinking. tidbit, uh, and I'm not an expert at it, but it morning. definitely morning. How are you doing? Changed my perspective wow. on all that. I know. I, I do. I do. I do like that that input. That's very good. Like, uh, so okay. It's just where we're at. We're um, okay. <laughs> So uh, the basic social unit was called Beit Ab. All right, so now you're thinking, okay, this is Hebrew stuff, I'll never remember this, but this is actually something you can remember uh, fairly easily. Uh, Beit is, means house, and like our, our church is named Bethel. Which, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's that, and Ab is, you know, Abba, father. Okay, so Ab is, father Abba is a little more endearing term. Ab is the proper, if you will, basic. So Beit Ab, the father's house. So now, now that you know that the father's house is the basic social unit, try to remember all the times you can, you can, you can, you know, just kind of, uh, just off memory, how many times you've read that in your Bible. If you've read, especially through the Old Testament, I did it like a search in my tablet, um, and the father's house came up in the ESV translation 70-something times. It is mentioned very often, especially like in the book of Genesis. You'll see it a lot, in, you'll see it throughout the Old Testament. So this is why it's important. It, it was really, indeed, the basic self of society and everything else. Then you talk about belonging to a wider clan, then you talk about belonging to a tribe and, and to the nation, then, like, on the margin, essentially. A little off subject, but mm -hmm. uh, the markings on, on those words, mm -hmm. is, it, are the, is that for pronunciation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How do you pronounce it? I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, is that, <laughs> is that like in the Hebrew language? Yeah, that's, that's, that's transliteration of Hebrew. That's, like, trying to... Put Hebrew into into the Latin alphabet, okay. um, but yeah, that's that's what it is. <laughs> Beit Ab means the father's house. Okay, so the father's house represented the patriarch, his spouses, uh, children, and grandchildren living under his care. The men would stay in their father's house, while the women would be married off and become part of their husband's Beit Ab. So think about Isaac and Rebecca. Think about Ruth. So remember, with Isaac, he uh, you know they 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 had to go and. Uh, you know, the, get the bride, and then the bride comes into the family, and she becomes part of the family. We saw that with Ruth um, when we talked about the book of Ruth, that um, uh, Ruth was very fiercely loyal to Naomi. She got married into that family, and even though she actually would have been a lot better off leaving the family, like economically, you know, speaking of not, she was better off staying, actually, but no one was able to see that because socially and economically, she would have been better off, better off leaving and trying to remarry rather than staying with Naomi as, as two widows, but she did anyway. Um, so so that's, that's how that dynamic worked, and just as an interesting aside, um, so a woman is, was expected to change her loyalty from her father's house to her husband's father's house. Um, but if you think in the book of Genesis, when it says God created a male and female, and it says, man shall leave his father and his mother, 
and cling to his wife. Now, when that was spoken in this culture, that sounded completely upside down. What do you mean man shall leave? It's the wife who leaves, you know. But the point was in fidelity. The point was in the relationship. Your wife is now your most important relationship. Yeah, you're staying with your father and your brothers and so on and so forth, but they are not your number one priority. Your wife is your number one priority because if you think about it, it's ever so easy. This woman comes in as a stranger into the family. It's ever so easy for her to get isolated. You know, there is the, you know, brothers and, and, and their mom and maybe even un unmarried sisters, you know, and they kind of form a clique and she's, she's kind of the outsider. Right. But the book of Genesis instructs, no, 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 no. Don't think of it that way. Think of it the, the other way. You are actually leaving your parents, even though you're staying with them physically. Uh, in terms of your loyalty, you're leaving them and you're, you're clinging to your wife. So that's just, a, just an interesting aside. But scholars estimate that these families could number up to 30 members. So that's what Cindy was, was saying earlier in, in uh, the Dominican Republic. Uh, so many people living together. Um, uh, about three generations worth of uh, uh, it, it's what it translates to. So the strong patriarchal, uh, strong patriarchal culture explains why orphans and widows were considered to be the most vulnerable members of society that others were expected to take care of. And we have an example in Deuteronomy 10 where there is an express command to take care of the uh, widows and orphans. And you remember that, I'm sure, from the New Testament. Uh, it's mentioned in Galatians, I believe, and I know in James it's, it's mentioned. Um, so widows and orphans, why were they the most vulnerable? Well, if the whole structure is built around male membership, if you lose the male head, your company goes out, basically. It, it, it's very hard for your company to continue to, and I keep using the word company, because to me, family, like I said, uh, resembles companies in, in our sense, that uh, modern sense, in, in some way, anyway, that it was an economic it was an economic unit. So yeah, you lose the head, it's, it's, really, it's really, really hard. And that's, and that's still present even in some cultures today. Oh, My mom, absolutely. having worked with a lot of doctors that work from India, that if, if a sister-in-law mm -hmm. lost her husband, her brother-in-law was, I mean, was expected to make sure she was taken she care was taken of. Care even of. if she was perfect, you know, they, right. for example, our family doctor is a woman. Right. But her husband passed away in her 30s. Oh, okay, and wow. so... Her family unit is very, very important, but I mean, she's perfectly capable of taking Take care, care of herself, herself right. and, and has because she's a doctor. Right. And, <laughs> However, right. her family unit is extremely important to her well being and to right. just her as a whole. Yeah. That's her so, first. I mean, that aspect is still very, very present in today's culture. I mean, and it was just expected. And, and yeah, mom absolutely. even worked with somebody that I think he. His sister-in-law and nieces and nephews came in and moved in with them because there was, they really didn't have anywhere else to go. Yeah. And so it was his responsibility, not begrudgingly, willingly, you know, you know uh, they are mine now. Totally, you know? um, totally in this, in this uh, clan membership and, 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 and loyalty, it's actually something that I had personally uh, uh, somewhat experienced where I grew up um, and it was kind of, uh, the, it was a society that was kind of moving away from, from the old ways and into the new ways, but it, the, the, the cut is never clean, you know, it, there's always some, some residual stuff. And, you know, I remember like my mom emphasizing family, 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 and to me, that, that didn't sit well with me because it, it, it seemed like it was family regardless of what they do. Like, you know, and I'm like, well, no, there is right and wrong and there is, you know, <laughs> Dumb people and smart people, and I don't want to. I don't want to support them just because they're my family. You know that I, I, I really don't don't like that. You know, but no, it's family. You can't say bad things about family. You have to, you know, stick with your aunt and so on and so forth. So so yeah, there there is this this stuff is and actually even if you um if you read uh, maybe something about Scottish history um, even as late as probably the 18th century I think. In the West Highlands, the clan culture, clan was the most important uh, unit. Um, and, and, you know, if, if you read about, like, let's say, the Glanco Massacre or, or things of that time period, uh, they thought of them as, as belonging to the clan, first and foremost. The nation was way out there, you know. It was, it was, it was a clan. And, like, even think Hatfields and McCoys. <laughs> and, you know, that's, again, hill country, hill culture, and, and you know, having that same concept of, of family belonging. They were like gangs. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, they were. They, they were. were yeah. Thugs. Yeah, they, they were. Well, and initially, it was out of necessity. It just yes. Absolutely, and absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it was spot on. Necessity. Spot on. It wasn't. It was a necessity. It was an economic necessity. All right. So, uh, but that's that's where widows and orphans come in as is the most vulnerable. Um, and once the family would become too large, it would split up. 
All right, so naturally you hit a certain point and you can, you know, there's just too many people to, for one patriarch to, to, to handle. And think about Abraham and Lot in Genesis 13. So actually, if you think of this, the entire story of Abraham, you know, he leaves with his, uh, uh, Terah is his father, and then his brother dies, right? But uh, Abraham still takes care of his nephew, Lot. He takes Lot with him because he has this responsibility. But then they come at a point in Genesis 13 where they're too big, all right? And there was a quarrel between different uh, shepherding, shepherding uh, groups, and they said, okay, all right, we, we, we've become too big, let's go ahead and split up. So they split up. But then what happens uh, uh, in Lot moves to the area of, the, of, of Sodom, and the area gets attacked uh, by, by, I believe it was Chaldeans. Uh, Lot gets taken captive alongside with other people. And what does Abraham do? He goes to rescue him. Why? Because he still, still feels this patriarchal duty that he has to lay his resources on the line to, to go rescue Lot. So that's, that's, uh, that, that was the mindset of the time. Okay. So that's the patriarchal family. It was patrilineal. Uh, we kind of touched on that in the beginning, but that basically just means that the first uh, male, oldest male member is the one who inherits this position usually. Normally, that would be the oldest male member. Now, exceptions were made, and we read about those exceptions in the Bible. Uh, exceptions were made when maybe, you know, the father figures out, okay, the first son is, is a complete, you know, dunce, and, I'm, <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the second son's actually a lot smarter, so I, I'm just going to, you know, hand, hand that to him. Um, so, so we see that, in, but, but this, this male lineage is, is, is the reality that's reflected in the genealogies. Like when we read genealogies, you know, we all love like when we start reading, and uh, Abraham beget Isaac, and Isaac beget Jacob, and you know, it just goes off and you don't even read the rest of it. Um, and, and with a good reason, because we don't care about genealogies. However, they did a lot, obviously. So when they do mention women in genealogies, and Matthew does mention women in genealogies, it's usually to get your attention. It's usually to make a point. His women don't normally belong in genealogies. They're usually not the important one. But these women were important enough for Matthew to bring them up because he wants to make a point. And who are the women men mentioned in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew's genealogy? Rahab. Rahab, very good. Ruth was there as well. Uh, Sarah. Uh, Sarah. No, Sarah, Sarah was not Sarah mentioned. Mary. Mary. Well, okay. <laughs> she, yeah, she's kind of important, but actually she's not even in the genealogy. She's in the second one. She's in the, uh, not, not, not the name, it's, uh, okay, uh, I'm thinking, all oh, right, but you, you, you could be right, you could be right, I'm not, uh, yeah. Um, I know, right? I was thinking most of these Old Testament, Old Testament ladies that were, that were, that were mentioned in Matthew, it's, it's actually. Tamar the other one. Tamar, yes, very good, very good, excellent. So these were women who did something extraordinary and had to be, had to be mentioned. Um, uh, so, so, you know, a lot of the times what we see in the Bible, again, why it's important to study the culture, because a lot of the, the, the stuff that, that, that's said there actually contradicts the cultural norms. Like, like I said earlier, man shall leave his wife, or his father and his mother, and cling to his wife. Th that was, you know, kind of, wait a second. How does that work? It's the wife who leaves. So a lot of this stuff is really kind of challenging the culture. And it's like, why are there women in the genealogy? Well, because those women were important. They did something so monumental that their, you know, males in that generation were, you know, not as, as, as important and didn't contribute as much to the redemptive history. All right. So that's, that's what patrilineal means. And the firstborn would receive a double portion of the father's inheritance. So why would the firstborn receive the double portion? Well, we talked about uh, uh, he's expected to, to uh, govern the family, but he's also expected to take care of the family. So he gets the double portion so that he, he has resources in order to help out those who might be in need. That's the idea behind it. I'm sure it was abused all over the place. <laughs> His portion and then the portion of the family. Right, exactly, exactly. So, so that's, that's, that's the double portion. So, um, I don't know, uh, Dan and Cindy, if you gave your kids for Christmas, like the oldest gets double for the rest of them. <laughs> uh, I never had that. Yeah. <laughs> Glad she's not here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need to discuss this next year. Undo some <laughs> some back pain. Yeah. So, all right. So, that's case, then I'll go Retroactively. So. Retroactively, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. And the last point we want to make uh, about families that it was patrilocal. Now that, that's, that's an interesting term I'm sure everyone's heard of before and uses all the time. 
<laughs> Petrolocal means that they all live together in, in what would resemble a compound. Now, uh, it's almost like, okay, why does this even need to be mentioned? We'll, we'll see in a second. Um, so it would more resemble a, really a compound than, than, than actual you know, houses in, in our Western modern sense. The term beta was also used for the physical location of where they lived. Okay, so it's not just for the family as a concept. It is also used for the, for the physical location where they live. Now, originally, uh, like during the time of Abraham, Abraham was a nomadic, uh, uh, nomadic shepherder, so they moved a lot. So their beta would consist of a lot of tents, big tents, huge tents. They would have to pick up and, and leave, but that's what it was. However, as the people of Israel eventually settled in the land and became more sedentary, they started building houses. So Beda became a built house, built building. And actually, around the time of Jesus, it was a, a pretty standardized, from what archaeology uh, has been able to uncover, it was a pretty standardized shape home. Uh, and there's an example in, in, your, in your handout. It was uh, basically a, a four-bedroom pillared house, is what, what we call it today. Uh, and that's where family would, li would live. And again, 30 members, up to 30 members or, or so in, in a four-bedroom space. But then what Cindy said, you know, she saw in the Dominican Republic people in two-bedroom homes, you know, 15 people. So that's about the same ratio, really. Um, and this would be, this would be where, where they would, um, you know, there would be a big courtyard, or relatively big courtyard. And a lot of the domestic chores were done there. Uh, you know, you have to, uh, you know, take care of, you know, animals. You have animals uh, that, that actually lived right there and with you. You didn't have a barn as a separate thing. Uh, there was actually a special uh, uh, space. If you if you want to look it up online, there's some better pictures. I use this one because copyright stuff, um, so I, I was able to use this one. But um, uh, there, there was actually a section for animals, and that's where the story about Jesus, uh, you know, about about being born in the manger, is, is perhaps not as cruel sounding as it is as, as, as it come across in our day and age. Because if someone was put in with the animals, it means they were put inside of their house. Right? It, there was, it was part of the house. Uh, so it wasn't like, okay, you know, there's a barn out there in the field, you know, go take a hike half a mile and, and, and you'll find an empty barn. Um, it, it was actually part of the, part of the household. Um, so you took care of the animals, you know, and, and all, everything had to be done manually. You had to make your own clothes. You had to, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, flour. Uh, I, I'm sure you didn't actually grind the flour here. But anyway, you had to bake, you had to cook, uh, wash, and so on and so forth. So this was what what uh, what the beta would have been in the time of Jesus. So consequently, my friends and Larry, I know you're going to be very disappointed to hear this because of one of your favorite songs, but consequently there are no mansions in heaven. <laughs> All right? There are no mansions in heaven. Um, by the way, uh, if uh, you have that book or have read that book by Don Piper, 90 Minutes in Heaven, Please toss that out if you have it, or, or, or just if the guy's a hack. And, and one of the things he, he says that he's seen a bunch of mansions in, in heaven. So where do we come up with this idea of mansions if, if they're not there? Because if you look at any, uh, any modern translation of the Bible, for John 14, 1 and 2, uh, it will actually say dwellings or something of that nature. The New King James has mansions, but it redeems it, no pun intended, it redeems it with the footnote saying dwellings, and it's really the King James, the original King James, that says mansions. Um, it's just a lousy translation. Is there one that's uh, many rooms? Mm -hmm. That's, that's a lot better. That's yeah. the actual. That's room. that's a lot. Absolutely, that's a lot better. That's a lot. That reflects this reality. The whole ma mansion idea, uh, you know. And I guess I didn't do all the research I probably should have done. I don't know if the word mansion in 1611, when King James was made, had a, a more modest meaning than it than it does. That, that's I guess that's a possibility. Um, Maybe simply the use of mansion and, and the concept of reward. It would have been more back it? then of a consolidation of uh, uh, wealth and resources. So everything under the house of the Father, so mm -hmm. like with God's house in heaven would be one large mansion, many rooms, but a consolidation of wealth and love. Cons right, community, yeah, community, sense. community, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, so the ma mansion is really... Uh, um, subjective. Subjective, <laughs> there you go. It's, a um, it, it's a little misleading, and, and I think, but I think what, what, where it comes from, why it's so emphasized, in, still by some folks, is I think it plays to that awful individualistic greed that, that we get cult, cult, we pick, up, pick up culturally. And it's like, I want to be the Lord of the manor, basically, you know. And I can only see, uh, you know, uh, Jesus thinking, you little punk, <laughs> you know, I'm, what I'm offering you is, 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 
a close relationship of a family, and you're thinking about being the Lord of the manor. <laughs> you know, that's uh, that, that's that's uh, so yeah. That song, Victory, Jesus. I heard about a mansion He has built for me in glory. We might need to do some <laughs> some revision there, or, um, or 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 maybe drop the drop the verse altogether. Could some of that be tied in with the, the talk about the New Jerusalem having streets of gold and that sort of thing? Like, uh, I suppose that could have the sparked, sparked the imagination. I, I suppose that could have sparked the imagination, absolutely. Well, and Cindy was saying uh, about your uh, reward. Uh, yeah, just that, that a skewed concept maybe during King James' time that, oh, you yeah. know, hey, when he's referring to a reward, hey, well, you know, that, that wealth concept that you... You might, well, if I'm getting a reward, reward well, it yeah, must like, be something having to do with wealth. With and, wealth, right, right. And showing that it's so culturally maybe, conditioned, right, okay, right, so in my so society, maybe, rich aristocrats live in mansions, so... You, you, right, you know, that, so maybe that, that's where the that's, thinking came uh, from as far as that goes. To a lesser degree, the issue of crowns, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, 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 so, so no, there is that royal verbiage. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of it, uh, a lot of that metaphoric language is, is beautiful, it conveys... Uh, it conveys the concepts really clearly, but if we get carried away with the metaphors, if we start milking the metaphors, then we come up with, with some, some really off-the-wall concepts. And, and, and I think this is unfortunately one of them where, where people kind of uh, connected to metaphors that were not necessarily intended to be connected. They, they, they were both kind of each own thing. Like I said in one of our previous classes, um, I, I talked to a person who struggled to understand how come church is the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. How do those things work together? Well, I mean, not at the same time in the same sense. You know, they uh, each is a metaphor that, that that conveys a different aspect of the of the truth. So, so anyhow, okay. So now we have a better understanding uh, of this culture. And by the way, what time is it? Ten thirty. Oh, all right. So now, now that we have a better understanding uh, of the patriarchal society, we can actually start uh, start defining this term redemption and seeing seeing where it comes from. So let's think. Sorry, can I just uh, bring up a, the, Absolutely. the last uh, one of the last topics? Uh, in, in Matthew, uh, the genealogy ends, uh, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, the husband. whom was born Jesus, was called the Christ. However, in Luke. Uh, Mary is not mentioned. It's okay. just it's, okay. uh, son of. So it was thought of Joseph, the son of Haley, the son of Matan. Thank you for so. fact checking. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. That's, <laughs> that, that, that. And Luke and Matthew have a different uh, uh, agenda behind their genealogies, which is why they they, they differ as much as they do. Um, and yeah, for Matthew, women, the women were, were uh, more important to, to bring up for whatever you know the emphasis he was trying to bring. Uh, for. For, for Matthew, uh, it was Jesus, the true Israelite. So starting with Abraham, and then all the important people in, 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 Israel, in Israel's history, whereas for Luke, it was Jesus, the true human, going all the way back to, to Adam, to creation. So it wasn't, the emphasis was, was a little different. But there, there are different, other differences to that that we uh, don't have the time to dwell on. Okay, so redemption. Let's see a few examples. We mentioned two of them already. We'll, we're going to mention the third one, and we're going to... Uh, uh, you know, consider these stories and then be able to offer a better definition of the word redemption. All right, so the first one is Ruth and Boaz. Um, again, you know, that's, that's uh, uh, the sermon, uh, I, I, that's the sermon I preached a, a month or so ago, um, and we can, we can recap that. I, I was really uh, personally uh, moved by the story. I, I love the story. It, it, was, it, was, it was a beautiful story, but it became a lot more meaningful when uh, I started digging into this uh, cultural context. Um, it, it wasn't just the story of a uh, of a lady who was heroic, and she was that in, in, indeed. But it was a story of rescue. It was a story. It was a story that was supposed to typify God's relationship with His people, uh, reaching out, <laughs> reaching out uh, in faith, and so on and so forth. So, what was Ruth's uh, predicament, real quickly? Well, there was a family from Israel that uh, had two sons. They moved to the country of Moab, which was a neighboring country, uh, not in very good terms with the Israelites generally, historically, but they moved there because there was a famine in the land and they thought they would do better, at least temporarily, in Moab. However, the ultimate misfortune happens that all three male members of the family die, first the father and then the two sons. The two sons said before they died, married two foreign Moabite women, Ruth and uh, Orpah. So, uh, after all the, the boys are gone, um, the situation is really dire. All right, so Naomi, being the wife and the Israelite, 
is thinking, well, I'm going to go back home and here the, the famine is no more. And, you know, here I'm a foreign woman. Over there at least I'll be a native woman. So, you know, life might be a little, little easier even though it's going, to, it's going to be awful. So, and then her two uh, daughters-in-law, one of them, they first want to follow her. She kind of tells them, look, kids, I love you, but, you know, you can do better than following me. All right, <laughs> just, you know, go back to your families, uh, have them marry you off, and, you know, start, you know, have kids and, 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 and be happy. Orpa takes her up on the offer because, you know, she kind of like, yeah, look, she's right, dude. Um, so, you know, I mean, I like her, but, you know, it's, uh, she's got a point. Uh, Ruth is this strange creature who sticks with her principles of, of, of some sort and sticks with Naomi. And to me, you know, the, uh, the, the point is that there is... Uh, a, a divine uh, enlightenment of Ruth to know to, that, that following the God of Israel is, is the right thing to do. But they go there, they are destitute. There are two women who are destitute. Um, Ruth gets out, starts gleaning, and we talked about gleaning being kind of the, the welfare program um, where, where people were required to leave certain portions of their field unharvested and also the stuff that they drop as they harvest, leave it on the ground so that those who are in need can come and pick it up and, and feed themselves. So Ruth does that, and uh, Boaz, who is the owner of the field, notices her. Uh, turns out that they are kind of related, or actually not them two, but rather Naomi's husband is kind of related to Boaz. And Boaz has the opportunity to redeem Ruth. Again, talking about this patriarchal family, when something happens in a family, other family members are expected to, to take care of that person. And the closer you are, the bigger your responsibility is, right? So Boaz wasn't a very close relative. He had to kind of clear up some paperwork, so to speak, and uh, you know, uh, obtain the right to become the redeemer. But he becomes the redeemer. He picks, you know, he marries Ruth. Uh, he's impressed with Ruth through and through. I mean, he 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 absolutely loves her. He sees in her. But he redeems her and Naomi as well. They become part of his family, and they're brought up from this horrible destitute situation that 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 happened in in, in life. So they were struck by a misfortune. Abraham and Lot. We we. Detailed that one already. Basically, Lot is captured by enemies. What does Abraham do? Picks up all of his men, all of his uh, resources, and goes off to rescue Lot. And he does do that. And, and he's successful. Abraham is determined and is successful. Again, why? That's the redemption that was expected from the family member. And the last one we never actually mentioned, but we're going to talk about right now, is Gomer and Hosea. Now, what do we know about that story? It's a Pretty, uh, it's an amazing story of yeah. forgiveness. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, but And faithfulness and loyalty mm -hmm. beyond comprehension, really. It is, it, it is. It's, it's actually incredible. almost an uncomfortable story to begin with, because mm -hmm. Jose is told to marry a prostitute. So, but let's, let's again think about society, society back then. Women who were prostitutes were women who were necessarily outside of the big up. All right, so they were already marginalized individuals. So there had to have been something traumatic, objectively traumatic in this person's life to, to drive them to this, this um, uh, state in life, okay? Uh, it, it is uh, rather unlikely for, for, for this to be the case that she just decided one day, this is the career path I want to take. <laughs> it, you know, it was not, it, yeah. Uh, in our day and age, um, the way things have been uh, devolving rather rapidly in our society, I can actually see that this might become a realistic, or has become a realistic thing that, that very young girls um, think that this type of uh, profession is, is something that can be and even should be pursued, but back then it wasn't. Okay, so so this is probably a person who comes from who comes from some 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 uh, misfortune already, but nonetheless, um, the bigger picture was really the relationship of God with Israel. I mean, that's what it was supposed to represent. But Hosea is told he's a righteous man. He's a he's a he's a uh, you know just a neat straight dude who is told go and marry a prostitute. Now, when you live in a village uh, that's you know 250 people like Hosea did, uh, that's not something that's going to be unnoticed. <laughs> <laughs> that is not something that people are just is like, oh yeah, I have no idea what happened, who that person is. Everyone knows that. So Hosea is setting himself up for public ridicule. Again, something a lot more important in that society was shame. Shame was a big thing. Right. Honor and shame were huge. Uh, when, when Jesus talks about if someone uh, strikes you in the cheek, turn the other one, it is not about the physicality of being struck on the cheek. It is about the loss of honor. If someone strikes you on the cheek, that is as, as offensive as they can get to as, as a person. All right, so it's not about 
the physical attack so much as the symbol that it, that, that it carries. Just a quick question. Um, the, the, uh, being a prostitute, obviously, in a village of 250, what about the guys that go pay the prostitutes? Yeah, I know, right? I know. That's, um, was there any shame with that? I mean, uh, man, man would have like gotten a bigger pass. Man would have gotten a bigger pass. For, 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 for sure, um, it, gotcha. you know, um, it's yeah. It was not a uh, think about the story of uh, uh, Judah and Tamar. That's another uh, horrendous story where Tamar comes through as, as the hero of it. Um, it's it's a complicated story in its own right, actually. Yeah. But 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 Judah is basically the one who um, does the dirty deed, or at least as far as his intention goes, and thinks he will bear no consequence. But then when Tamar is accused of doing the same deed, he wants to have her publicly executed uh, until he is confronted with the fact that he is actually the one who participated in, in the said deed, and, and then he says, oops. But n nonetheless... Well, but even the New Testament addresses it with the story of the woman who was dragged out. She was caught yes. in the act yes. of adultery and was dragged out in the streets. So chances are she was probably not clothed. Right. <laughs> dragged out in the streets in front of Jesus and said, what are you going to do with her? As everyone's standing around to stone her, right, where was right. the man? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, where the was man, the man? The man is. She not... wasn't doing it by herself. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, right. I mean, right. she was caught in the act. <laughs> right. So I mean, come on here, people. Where was the man? Well, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't yeah. mention. So, it, so that's right. Right. no, no, you're right. Question because you're, I, you're I, right. I really, no, the, I mean, I guess the, there's the, a side to every story. I mean, sure. it doesn't doesn't make it right, but it's that's often the case in your biblical here. stories. Unfortunately, yeah. there's you, but that was partially because of society and the man. Uh, the man's position had to be protected to some degree. Doesn't make it right. No, no, it doesn't but make it right at all. Of, but yeah. here's the thing: even even at its best, you know, uh, you can, we can we can talk. We talked about this patriarchal society, and we talked about the ideal. Of it, okay, yeah. so the ideal of it is that the the oldest guy in the house takes care of everyone. How did it actually play out in real life? No, humans right. are humans, you know. I mean, it was. I'm sure it was. It was. I mean, even in the Bible, we see all kinds of abuse of it. Even in the Bible, sure. we see all kinds of misuse of it, uh, let alone outside of the... And that's one beautiful thing about the Bible. It doesn't sugarcoat human behavior. He doesn't come through and say, Abraham was the perfect progenitor of the nation of Israel. No, he was actually the very, a very flawed progenitor of the nation of Israel, and so was everyone else after him. Um, but that's why, this, why the reality of redemption is so important. Bingo. Because we are all flawed, and We're, that's repeated throughout Scripture and history over and over and over and over again, and yet God still stands there with his arms wide open. Amen. So what is the what is the, the, the development further in Gomer and Hosea? So he marries her, even though you know he had no business marrying her. However, she at, at a certain point decides she's gonna go back to her old life. Why? Well, I mean, you know, it's 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 an irrational thing, obviously, but you know, we've all at least known people with, with bad habits, with addictions, who know that those addictions tear them down individually, and yet there is part of them that's emotionally so wedded to this lifestyle, they just slip back well, into Well, and how emotionally, what, we don't know what drove her to, to that to, to profession that, to begin in with, general. To begin with, yeah. What in her life scarred her to a point right. that she couldn't trust that this man was this going man to was care for her to be the and love husband. her in a way that yeah, she had not taken the trash out. <laughs> well, I mean, he just, I mean, how do you... Mm. Having lived in a situation where she sure. was used and abused constantly, no, yeah, right, right. How, uh, for her to try to wrap her head around the fact that sure. this man has now married me and devoted his life to me. What's the agenda? It, What's exactly. The, what is he after? What is he after? Why is he after? So, so she, I, you know, what, what's her train of thought? We don't know any of this. We don't know, but non nonetheless, the point is, she slips back into faithfulness. Oh, she breaks breaks the marriage covenant that they that they had. So she <coughs> finds her as being up for sale. Okay. Right. She's she's up for sale, and he buys her back, and he that's buys her back, so and that and that's that's the mind blowing thing. He buys her back, and he takes her back, and the whole story is meant to illustrate the relationship between God and Israel. That even though you're a faithless uh, people, even though, even after all I've done for you, taking you out of the land of Egypt, yada yada yada, you know the story. Yeah. You guys still get pulled and, and give in to these to these urges to, to go off on your own. But God reaches back to to, to redeem them. So well, let's, and he's and Hosea is unrelenting. Uh, oh yes, he is in, under, in, he's in pursuing. pursuing. Yeah, he's it pursuing. Is, yes. It really is an amazing story. And there there was an author who wrote an absolutely beautiful illustration of this story, which you know, I mean 
anybody could read it, but it, it's probably one of my favorite books. Once I've read, oh. read it at different points in my life, so I found something different in the story each time I read it, and it's, it's just mind-blowing. And it, it's, to me, it, it, it's just a, an incredible illustration of God's relentlessness Pursuit. and how he will just per, consistently pursue us. And yet at the same time, he also reaches a point of, you know I love you. I've illustrated that. But now you need to come to me. You need to, right. You need to, you you need need to, to come, come to, to me. You need to reach back, right. Because I love you. I've redeemed you. I've forgiven you. But when are you ready to accept to, that to gift? Reach and back. it just, it's... It's, it's mind blowing, seriously. It really is so cool <laughs> to me. So anyway, th this is in, yeah, this is uh, you know read the book of Hosea basically. You you, yeah. you got all the the, the reviews. <laughs> yeah, right. It is an amazing book. <laughs> so it comes ten stars, you know, <laughs> ten out of ten. No, seriously, it, it is a great book. It, yeah. Okay, so let's let's try to offer a definition. Uh, actually, and I'm quoting direct from Sandra Richter. I mentioned her in the beginning as as kind of being the. Uh, uh, in a, in a sense, a source, or at least of the layout for, for what we've done here. So in Israel's tribal society, redemption was the act of a patriarch who put his own resources on the line to ransom a family member who had been driven to the margins of society by poverty, or had been seized by an enemy against whom he has no defense, or found themselves enslaved by the consequences of a faithless life. So with that in mind, now we have a, a much bigger and broader picture about what redemption meant to the society in which to, it was spoken. You know, when people thought of redemption, they immediately understood that it was applied to someone who is in a hopeless situation. It, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a real thing. It was, it was a thing that could happen to anyone. Anyone, you know, can have an, uh, something bad happen to them and go from, from, from being relatively well off to being... Uh, destitute like Naomi. She had a husband and two sons. She was, you know, as far as her side goes, she was set and then one day she woke up and none of them were there. Everything was gone. You know, the house burned down basically, you know, they, it, it, it was, things were gone. So, well, and the fact, you know, just in looking at that, the patriarch of the family risked shame on the entire family by redeeming the person mm -hmm. that they were reaching out to. Risked their entire family name and standing to reach out to that family member and say, we will still love you. Story of the prodigal son. Now think about that story through the lens of all of this, through the lens of the patriarchal family and the lens of sure. shame and, and honor. When a son says, you know, Father, I want my share of inheritance, it wasn't just I want my share of money, it, it is, I, I want, I, I don't Respect. want... Well, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, care about your life in general. I, you, you know, I, I don't care if you live or die. <laughs> um, so the whole family, he, he abandons the whole family. He abandons the whole enterprise. Then he goes off, he does as, as well as he, he did, and comes back, and the father takes him back in. So that's the picture of redemption. That is the picture because he was down to eating you know, with, with pigs, which, again, culturally, pigs were a big no-no, so eating with pigs meant, like, dude, you were eating out of a toilet, essentially. You know? yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's, that's low. That, yeah, that's the lowest of all you, you, you can get. So that's what redemption is all about, and that's the deep picture that, that it needs to evoke in us, is when we hear redemption, when we talk about redemption, next time we're going to hit covenant is going to be our next subject. And that one might actually even go over two lessons, uh, because it's so important. But when you hear about the covenant of, of re redemption, that's the, the uh, emotional response that the Bible is trying to get from its readers. It's like, you think of the people who are absolutely hopeless. You think about children who are kidnapped for trafficking. That's a hopeless situation, absolutely hopeless situation. And, you know, I, I don't think it's a bad thing to, to bring it up in this context. It wasn't a thing back then or not, not a big enough for, for the Bible to use it as an example, but I think in our society it'd be a pretty appropriate, uh, pretty appropriate um, example to use. So let's go ahead and uh, just wrap up with reading Colossians uh, 1, 13 through 15. He had delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You see, that's why we talk about God as our Father, Jesus as the Son of God. It is this patriarchal, patriarchal picture, an ideal one, not an abuse, but an ideal one, where the Father takes care of the, of the family, and the firstborn is the one who goes out and actually executes the will of the, of the Father on, on, on his behalf. So I hope I hope that's that's all I have. I mean, we can keep talking, we can keep discussing. I don't know what time we have, but uh, but ten till. I'm sorry, ten till. Ten till. Okay, so we're good. All right, thanks everyone. We'll uh, wrap it up here.